Welcome inside the Paris Sea Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. And we can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today. And as six years have gone by on my program, uh, the spirits have called at many a time and uh, oftentimes has answered my calls. And um, I get a chance today to uh, talk to a cat who's been a a pivotal uh, player and musician in my uh, recent existence in terms of finding peace and calm amidst the madness that we're all dealing with. Uh, He's long since, uh, this is many years removed from the music scene or the music industry, but it is such a high honor when I reached out to Jim Keltner a couple weeks ago. I said, where is this cat? Because I have to get to him and talk to him a little bit because he's been a huge inspiration for me. And now I get a chance to do it. Paul Stallworth, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, um, question for you. Um, I, uh, I was talking to uh, Julian Priester, who's a great trombone player uh, and uh, grew up in Chicago. Uh, and he really grew up with spirituals. And, uh, and he grew up playing on the bandstand with cats like um, uh, Muddy Waters and also played with Sun Ra in the 50s and kind of before Sun Ra went way out. And... Uh, but I wanted to ask you if you could just talk to the audience about how you developed your time feel, your your inner time feel. How did that come about for Paul Stallworth? Time feel. Time feel. Oh, time feel. Okay. <laughs> yeah, not not feel. Feel. Your, 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 your own feel. Because you know what it is like? There are cats today that, you know, I think a lot of peeps growing up in the digital world, they think that the arms and the and the shoulders and, and mm-hmm. they create on the drums, they create the sound. No, it's the heartbeat. So you have to have an inner time feel. And I wanted you to talk about your own evolution with your time feel. Well, um, I've never thought of it, but now, <laughs> now that I am, um, that's the Jake Feinberg show right there. Okay. You're, this is what, this is the point of the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it's just something that was there innate because uh, um, I surely didn't go looking for it. And uh, it was just something clicking inside of me that always got me kicked out of class before tapping on my desk and, you know, and patting on the sides of the, um, they had these old school desks that had these three metal sides and you put your books underneath. Sure. And they had great tones, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> Three different tones, and you go boom, doo, boom, boom, doo, boom, 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 and you know it, the tones were there, but the other thing came from somewhere I don't know. And so the first instrument I actually started playing uh, was drums, bongos actually. Wow. And because uh, I couldn't afford drums, and then when I finally could, I got me a snare. And maybe a year or two later, I got uh, a kit and played with some guys, you know, I was, I was living in Europe at the time, really young. And, um, so my influence of in music was, of course, my mom and dad are avid lovers of music. My dad loved the uh, gospel and country and my mom liked just about anything. So I was kind of around vocalizations and singing all the time. Did you, um, did you learn dynamics from them? I'm well. Only the dynamics that was offered through the music they listened to, you know, Mahalia Jackson and and stuff like that. Uh, um, and then when I finally got to uh, get my hands on drums, 
I was gone. <laughs> did you did you did you say you you were you were growing up in Europe? Did I hear that correctly? Yes. So yes. So this is interesting. Um, I mean, could you because where you go back to Minton's or Small's Paradise in Harlem? You know, the the culture was out in the street and. Um, even in L.A. at a time, or you could go into these, you know, New, New York and Puerto Rican neighborhoods and everybody had conga drums. What was the culture like on the streets of where you were living? I mean, was it was the music out and visceral? Like, was it right in your face? No. As a matter of fact, it wasn't. I think I, li- I got all of my, most 90% of my input from uh, those good old 45 RPMs, you know. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong. Still got him. <laughs> I love it. So, I mean, you're talking like, but we're, you're talking about like Mahalia Jackson. We're not talking about like, did you get, was your was your pops into like the sanctified sound, like Willie Banks and the Messengers and the, the you know, the, the, when I hear you singing. No, pretty much, yeah. pretty much the light stuff, you know. Yeah, the light stuff, right. <laughs> the cor- cor- you know, choral, choral kind of stuff, you know. Right. Um uh, and and that was their listening thing. And I mind when I got my my hands on records and stuff, I would listen to, it. of course, any Motown or Stax, uh, uh, any of those things with the big hole in it. <laughs> but your your were your were you uh, were your parents expats? Were they originally from Europe or are they from the states? No, from the states. Uh, my father was in the service, so uh, I was like an army brat, and. Uh, Besides living in uh, Europe and Asia for numerous years, uh, I spent, up until that point, less time in this country than I did in those. So the music was uh, way different. My own, my source of American music was through records. And um, so when I finally left Europe and came back, came back here, I was, I was a drummer. Absolutely. No, I want to. I want to stay with this pocket for a minute because mm-hmm. this is so fascinating. Where you're, like, where, when you got your hands on a trap set, can you talk about? Um, ultimately, like you talked about this innate field, you were clearly gifted with it. But you were. Did you recognize the um, the interplay between cats like Pistol Allen and Jamerson, where like any note could be the one theoretically you get into that melodic groove and i'm just curious about when you got on the trap set when you how quickly you started to not just keep time but actually play the melody play the tune because everybody else you everybody else had to be have their own internal rhythm yeah well it was, it was such a hit and miss thing because my actually my first trap set will usually would turn out to be somebody else's and uh <laughs> And if they got off of it, I'd be on it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. for the longest right. time. And, uh, you know, fortunately, not too many people got upset about that. But, uh, yeah, and, and I think because of where I was raised, my input was so, you know, I, I could listen to Asian music and and I can find a groove in it right now. Um, so, I mean, music, fortunately, music is so universal. You know, if you're listening and you can hear it, you can... Oh, well, uh, it seems to me you can actually you you can see the colors or the, the whatever it's whatever it is that energy, and if you can uh, let go enough and enjoy it, it goes it goes forever. So I I, I can't explain it much more than that in words because I was never professionally, you know, uh, learned or educated. In well, music. and that's and that's one reason I'm intoxicated with your. Uh, generation. I mean, I had a drummer from Tucson in here yesterday playing, talking, you know, part part application and part wisdom. And, and the dude came from Kentucky and never, you know, I mean, he's playing, he did like, he opened like a two or three minute solo and it was like just funky, man. It was just so funky. And, and, he, and he had, I don't think he's even practiced in his life. So mm-hmm. it's sort of, it's like this, it's like this gifted thing. So can you talk about, I mean, uh, what year did you come back? I mean, did you start your professional music career overseas? Uh, more amateur. You know, I played in uh, one or two bands of people my age, and then I, I, I kind of got into playing at the uh, service club, which was a military thing where they allowed, you know, they gave 
soldiers access to things like music equipment, a library, or games and stuff. And I'd go down and jam with some of these guys, and I wound up playing with a couple jazz trios, uh, which which is something I'd never even listened to, but it was just that thing. It was obvious, you know. And wait, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. You have copies of these tapes? Oh, no. So no, these, you, there were no tapes. These were these were done like in cl- little, little bars and clubs and uh, social centers. Uh, it, real amateur. This wasn't professional. The professional thing didn't start till I got back over here. Yeah, no. I want to stay with the jazz for a minute. You're talking. Are we? Can we peg this like early '60s, mid '60s? When was this? Well, let's see. I got back in '64, so it would have been uh, late '50s. In the early '60s. Wow. Unbuilt. Can you talk a little bit about? Were you playing? standards i mean who were you i mean were you the type of cat like i dig the fact that you didn't have an academic you learned on the bandstand but were you hip to uh like were you interested in finding out who was playing like uh with bill evans on traps and trio or or colin bailey with vince garaldi were you getting all were you (laughs) were you trying to study were you aware of those cats absolutely not never heard of them (laughs) i never heard of them I you know the old per- person I le- I remember I uh, listened to the album to learn how to do these press rolls and stuff was a guy named Gene Krupa. Oh, of course. Yeah, and uh, besides him and uh, Louis Armstrong, and uh, let's say who else would I remember? Those were the only kind of jazz folks I knew, and the people I played with over there who are, you know, I wouldn't know their names now if I could sing it. But, you know, they were trios or quartets. You know, like even one night on a stormy night, I had I was called in to go set in with, uh, what's their name? The Platters. Oh, my God. The Platters? Their drummers, yeah, the drummers didn't make the gig, and they were at this at this service club, enlisted men's service club. and No drummer. And I, I, I had heard of them for sure, and I was just blown away. That was probably my first gig. I don't even know if I got paid. It didn't even matter. <laughs> no. Wait, wait, but that is not, I mean, what were you, that's not jazz, really. I mean, that. No, I, well, it isn't, but I mean, you know, that's what, for me, I, music was just this un, un uh, classified thing. I dig, man. It's all music. It's yes, all music. Absolutely. Okay. That's why I love, I can play country music, I can play, I can play drums to classic music, classical music, and I do, just for fun, because it's, classical music is pretty damn funky. <laughs> <laughs> no, when you get up to it, it really is. No, I, well, I don't know. I haven't got, Harry, so, I mean, you really, like, um, this is fantastic. So, did you play in the jazz context? Did you ever play in, like, a, an organ quartet? Mm, oh, well, yes, absolutely. Um, when I got back here, there was a place called Jimbo's in Monterey Bay Area, Seaside. I used to play down there for weeks on the weekends with a... Uh, this trio and um the guy played b3 with pedals and we had a sax player you, he was kicking pedals who was the b3 cat who was that cat oh my god oh. i'm stretching you out dude he was kicking yeah. pedals which most b3 players don't they normally play the left hand bass this guy right. was... no, no, this guy this guy was pedals man oh my god you gotta tell me this is this is what i live for see he was pedal he he it was basically organ horn and drums right oh my god that's right. just did you and and so i mean can you talk about the jazz aesthetic though I mean, in the feel i mean you you can't just fake that i mean listen i mean country you know uh you, you know first things were on the two beat and then dixieland went to you know on the four but when you talk about swinging a band i mean can you talk in your own way how you learned to swing the band just by listening. I mean, if there's anything I got good in my life in this body is my ears. My ears uh, have gotten me wherever I've gone to as far as music goes, because uh, I still to this day don't read linear music. I've been fortunate enough to let to play with people who allow me to do, you know, what I do, and in within the structures of, of a chord. So if you know, give me a chord chart, I can do that. But if you put notes in front of me, I'm out. 
I'm out. <laughs> a lot of a lot of peeps don't still aren't great sight readers, and there's some of them, but they have such great feel, you know. But you're, yeah. You, would you say would you say that you're? Uh, can you talk putting your ego aside? Uh, you're being very modest, obviously, but it's like, can you just talk about? an experience that you had consistently even in your amateur years when your ears grew the most based on the fact that the other people that you were playing with when it grew the most i guess yeah kind of like when i was uh, i went to uh, monterey peninsula college for like a year and a half or so and i joined the uh, the jazz band Somehow or another, they let me get in there, and I actually played with them for a couple of days or so, and we played, had a great time, and then when something came up where something had to be specific on some charts or something, the guy teacher realized I couldn't read, and uh, that broke my heart, because I had to be excused. Hmm. Uh, but it uh, they didn't know it until then, so I thought everything was cool. So at that point, I realized that, you know, um, I wasn't destined for, you know, trying to program. I mean, you know, actually, I wasn't even running around looking for new stuff. I, it was just stuff that was always coming to me. I would make up stuff while I'm driving or if I was sitting on the toilet or I still do it today. Matter of fact, before you called, I was trying to kick out this melody in my head that's I been screwing with me fucking all morning i love it did paul stallworth still burning burning creator so you you've had these that's what's driven you it's not about getting you know you know trying to you know comp this person or that you just you've had melodies in your head your whole life oh yeah yeah and 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 you know and of course some of the ones that i hear that are out there uh, and some of them are really unfortunate because some of them I really hate, but they, <laughs> I guess they call them earworms or whatever. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Can you talk a little bit about, you know, even before Attitudes ever was conceived, because we're going to have to spend at least an hour just alone on Attitudes, but the the can you talk about a time in your career, uh, in your own world, when a melody materialized and it actually came into a, a, a particular song that, that wound up on, on a record. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, the one that comes to mind immediately is, uh, some, a tune I wrote with Harry Nilsson hmm. it's called easy. Wow. And we did it. We did it at like something like, writing it around six or between six and eight o'clock in the morning at some bar in Hollywood that they opened up for us just to come in and play pool. <laughs> and so we're playing pool and, and, and drinking. And, and, uh, we started singing this thing and it just came out. And then we actually recorded it that same day, next, that same night that we went back in the studio. I'm looking um, here. Is it, is it, uh, I got two easier for me, or it's so easy. It's so easy. There it is. All right, can we listen to it? Sure. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Put, let's put it in, baby. Um, here we go.
I mean, this, I mean, you are, are, I mean, you just made my day again because I've, I've never even, this is, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not that schooled in, in, in music. I mean, I certainly, I get my hands on this eclectic stuff and, but this is, um, so this, this was like sunset strip, but I mean, more, dawn sessions you were playing or are you just in there just drinking whiskey and playing pool? Well, we were in the studio that night before and, uh, and as usual, you know, when you get out, sometimes you're still humming. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So we goes, Harry goes, well, listen, we gotta go to this place. I know where we can go over there and get in. They'll open the door for us. I go, well, okay, but you know, I, my wife's got to go to work, and I gotta pick her up and, and take her to <laughs> Warner Brothers to do her job. So I actually drove home, picked her up, took her there, and I went back and met him at the bar. We that's when we did that. Thing and we started about talking about how things are so hard, but really, it's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> I love Paul Stallworth, dude. This is my, I mean, these are the interviews I live in. Die. So, I mean, this, I just want to go back to something because I've interviewed again for the for the audience. The, I'm, I'm, were you playing bass on that track or drums or, or on, on bass? Bass. So, I know Stallworth from a bass component, but I mean, I've interviewed a lot of the cats, uh, David Garibaldi from Tower of Power, Greg Rico, yeah. From, Sly Stone, Michael Shreve. I'm very tight with all these cats, and I've interviewed them all. And um, Michael, Michael was at San Mateo Community College in the big band. I don't know if he read it that that time. Garibaldi was in a big in the in a Dick Crest big band, and I want you to, if you can, how did that experience? I know it ended in heartbreak because you couldn't read, but but what what did you walk away from? What did because like swinging a big band is not like swinging a quartet. Did you could you talk a little bit about what what you learned from that? Um. Well, I guess at the time maybe that if I could you know, but that if, don't be afraid to go for it. You know, um, there's a certain amount of confidence it gave me. I guess. Because if you don't have that, then you you know you you're less liable to go outside that bubble, you know. What bubble? Can you? I mean, for the non-musician, when you say go forward and outside the bubble, what what do you mean? Well, like um, like right now, when I, I don't get to play much with a lot of guys, but when we do, I play with some folks. It's it's all freestyle, and. The bubble meaning that, you know, I, I notice like and I watch a lot of people jam, just, you know, free jamming. They'll uh they'll be it'll be great, you know, it'll stay in a group, but there's like there's no there's no arms and legs to it kind of a thing. I dig. And uh for me, when I get to play it's which is so great, it's like wow, I, I feel I guess they also come some drums because I play my bass and keyboards and guitar just like I play drums. <laughs> basically wow. only there's there's these notes and so i'm i i have a great memory for patterns and stuff you know um uh and just moment things uh so i can when i when i'm playing with someone i'm i barely feel like sometimes i feel like i'm taking the lead but i'm really listening to everybody and supporting everyone and that opens up a lot of doors well, especially if you, I mean, this is to me like an incredible, I mean, did you have perfect pitch or, or did you have any of these other sort of innate things where, because you're here, you're listening when you're listening, mm -hmm. it raises the collective consciousness of the group tenfold. And it's, I believe that it, it, and, and, and one of the things today you look, you go see gigs and you know, you'll see drummers and they're very busy. 
or bass players and they're very they got to play a lot of notes and they got to be yeah. you know and they got to take up a lot of space and there's just not a lot of soul you know i don't i don't feel this and i don't i definitely don't feel the space and i just right and that word space i love that because I, I forget who he said that it's it's a jazz musician that said it's not the notes you play it's the ones you yeah it's, you know who said that miles fucking Davis. miles yeah exactly that's right. exactly that's right. you know and that's the point is that uh it's this it's not the notes you play it's the notes you don't play and yeah, I just got a chill thinking about that. It's just woo. <laughs> it's beautiful, dude. You're like, I, I mean, were you ever? Did you ever want to be? You just wanted to cut your own. So you you were in. Uh, I'm sorry, was it Monterey? You said, and the big band kind of. Uh, yeah. The thing didn't materialize, and then you kind of ventured sl more slowly. Did you just kind of go down the coast to uh, La La Land? How did you wind up in the in the? Well, I. Interesting. I I was pretty much set on sticking around that area because I like Monterey. It's a great place to live at the time, and uh, I could play music every weekend or if I wanted to. And you know, I had friends and uh, had a good job working at a furniture store. And some guy, a friend of mine, came up and he played guitar, and he says, "You know, there's this guy named Round Robin who's playing in Salinas, and uh, he's got this." record out called Land of a Thousand Dances hmm. and he's got this bass player who is either leaving or he wasn't happy with and he said why don't you come out and take a listen you know and I, I came out and I listened and uh, actually I sat in for a couple tunes next thing I knew I got the job with him and I was off on the road for uh, almost two years holy cow. I'm sorry you had not ever played the bass in a professional context no. 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 Paul Stallworth in the most matter-of-fact fashion. I mean, this is ridiculous. I just got off the phone with Chuck Rainey, and he was just, I mean, we had an, a cathartic conversation. He was talking about Charles Mingus taught him how to, with the upright, taught him with the electric how to make the notes round. Um, uh, and you're talking here about you didn't have, I mean, you just picked up the bass and said, well, all right, I got natural feel and talent, so I'm just going to try it? Yeah, well, before that, particular night i had been playing bass like with the a little local uh, uh, filipino group with an accordion and something else uh <laughs> you know we, were, they we singing, were they singing they were singing were they singing in a different language no we were doing you know current kind of tunes pop tunes familiar tunes but we just had an accordion player the accordion is what got us all those little filipino gigs because wow. they like accordions that's i was gonna say why is it filipino they, they love the accordion that's interesting yeah they seem to like it because we could play a lot of songs that are that three-fourths the stuff you know which is which <laughs> sounds great with i accordion. love it i love it yeah <laughs> i dig so uh so so at, you know that's all i was doing but so when i sat in with robin that was a whole other thing because he played he sang tunes that i was familiar with also Sam and Dave tunes and uh, stuff like that. So, was it a? I, I don't. Was this cat? Uh, was it a Chitlin Circuit kind of gig? I mean, what, what kind of what kind of clubs were you playing? Pretty much, yeah. You know, the Phase Three in Oregon or uh, some whiskey bar in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, uh, Boston at the uh, the War Zone up in Boston. Oh my God! Uh, the, the, I, I the Combat Zone. Yeah. Oh my exactly. God, I, dude! I used to, I, inter, I there was a professor up in Vermont that I'm friends with, and he used to those organ trio gigs in those in those burlesque houses. Man, that was like three three hours three hour gigs, one hour on, one hour off. It put money in people's pockets. That was an oh, amazing. Oh man, we we had we had five hour sets. These were horrible. <laughs> we, in one one night, some guy comes in there and he threw a pipe bomb in the damn place. Yeah. And uh, and then uh, after the 30 days we were up, we wanted to leave. The guys, the club owners didn't want us to go, so they would take our, you know, our equipment and stash it somewhere. And where they stashed <laughs> it, we found found some other band's equipment down there too. <laughs> they, they hold you hot. They hold you hostage there. Yeah. So we managed to get it out of there, and we split out of the hotel and beat it out of town at three o'clock in the morning. Um, 
But yeah, the, and then I went back there years later when I played with Al Jarreau, and I had to go down there just to see what it was like. It's still the same. <laughs> well, there was also like a very infamous uh, football player from Harvard that was murdered. It kind of shut down that whole combat zone. Those things were thriving at one time. I mean, I, when I interviewed Ahmad Jamal, I opened with this huge monologue, and I mentioned that he played burlesque houses, and he said, "How do you? Who tipped you off to that?" I said. I said, Ahmad, I said, after doing a thousand primary source interviews with the cats, I just know <laughs> that was a place of employment for you guys. And, you know, they yeah. were just, they were trading off. That was the other thing. I mean, he was he would trade off. He would play key, uh, piano and it was just piano and drums. And so they just trade off back and forth for eight hours. I mean, it was exhausting. Yeah. But at the same time, oh, I, my God, it was just when you look back at that, do you feel like it was uh, it helped you? uh find your own individual voice. I mean, again, we're talking to somebody here who kind of, you were naturally gifted, but yeah. Okay. There was grief and pipe bombs and weirdness, but, <laughs> but, but what, what did you take away from that? That, that was positive for your career. Chops. That has a very interesting, that, that, that connotation is very different now because people, people walk out of academia now. I don't believe vocabulary and music. Well, I mean, I mean, chops, chops in life too, and not just on the instrument. Can you give an example? Uh, well, some of the stuff that I would kind of compose in my mind or in musically, they were all kind of a reflection of what I've, we'd been through. Like we, we did a tune called Power, which was uh, we used for our break tune when we take a break, but it was like this really powerful, uh, strong thing, which we related back to you know what it took for us to get out of Boston or what we went through in Boston and the power of uh, the power of power. Uh, that's what I mean by the chops. I mean, you know, I, I learned a lot of stuff there, not just licks and stuff, but uh, gave me an insight about timing and, uh, and what I should be doing and how I should be doing it and, and where I shouldn't be doing it. Uh, and, you know, that all went along with just being on the road, too. Right, um, man. There was li it was it was a uh, life experience. I mean, were you were you? Yeah. Was that? Uh, did you feel like your life was in danger at times? I mean, I've talked to cats. Oh yeah. You know. You, you so you you had because I mean I talked to cats that you know that were like uh, guys that were playing with Youssef Latif. They'd wind up in some. This again. This is different. But they were in Colorado somewhere and. Uh, you know, it was an all white town and next thing you mm -hmm. know, you know, next thing you know, they're, they're being chased out of town by that, that clan, you know? And yeah. Yeah. Did that happen to you on the road? Well, yeah, several times. Uh, let's see, we had, we had a run in, uh, with some folks down in, uh, what is that place? In Texas. Um, in Abilene? I remember. <laughs> no, yeah. uh, it was with the center of the Birch Society. Oh uh, yeah, I have to look that up. All right, so but yeah, but uh, it was a it was a mixed race band you were in. Yeah, uh, the, you know they were looking at us because we were all Hollywood because you know we're, I was wearing elephant pants and you know <laughs> long hair yeah, and yeah. and I got, always got the thing about oh what are you trying to do look like Jimi Hendrix you know, <laughs> and, you know we got ran out of uh, even Southern California man. Uh, uh, Oxnard, I think it was. Mm -hmm. We played at some beer bar or somewhere down there, and and boy, it was. We never even finished the set, man. I just says, you know, we didn't need this shit. Let's pack up and go, you know. And we did. We packed up and left. And, and then the uh, showdown with guns at the OK Corral in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> Jeez, I mean. You, these were just patrons going at each other, or you guys, you guys had your own, well, uh, own. Your back? Yeah, well, they came after our drummer, who was a. Uh, it's funny. He was uh, we said Art Abodili. He was uh, from Saudi or someplace, uh, and he he got into it with these cowboy boot guys there at the bar, and they uh, they were calling him a uh, what was it a. Uh, camel jockey or something right and it set him off and he got pissed so they followed him back to the motel where we were staying and then they called him out they got him out in the parking lot and Jeez. there was guns and then my 
oh, this guy, Ron Robin, who we were working for, he came out with a gun, and then I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> what the hell? I just want to play some music, man. Wow. And that, and that cultural bias and racism reigns supreme again. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, it's just blowing me away, man. It's just, uh, yeah, like a bad dream coming all over again. Um, so, um, I just, before we, I, I could go for an hour. I, I have to get my daughter from school and I know you got to go. Um, so did, could you just talk about how you met Jim Keltner? Yes. There was a thing in LA at the record plant, uh, called at one time years ago. I don't remember when it was early seventies. I'm sure. Um, that Gary Kelgren and Chris Stone, who owned the record plant, excuse me a minute, get some water here. No problem. Uh, put on a uh, situation that was not only to help promote the studio, but giving a venue for artists from all over the country, all, all over the world for that matter, to come to uh, on special nights. And it was called the Keltner Fan Club. And, it was uh, called the Keltner Fan Club? Yes, the Jim Keltner Fan Club. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, <laughs> he had his own fan club at that point. Well, they, they did it for him. It wasn't something he set up, you know. It, it was pretty cool. And like I said, it was a, big, it was a scene. And, and uh, we had Studio C, which was this big studio, so that means a lot of people could be in there playing different instruments and stuff. And uh, somehow or another, I got invited down there, and I went there, and I thought, wow, this is crazy, man. I mean, everybody from Mick Jagger to, I mean, you name it at the time, they would be in and out of there. Um, wow. And so Some, I, I went yeah, there. Go ahead. go ahead. I went there a couple times, and uh, and that was probably near the end of the the, the, the whole scene. So after, after a couple, three times going there, the – the numbers of people would turn from, you know, 25 down to 15 and down to 10. And all of a sudden it turned out to be just four people left. It was Cal there, me, Cooch, and David Foster. Oh, my God. Just one night randomly it got down to four. Yeah. Oh. And I think there was a percussionist and somebody else, too, when we were still jamming. But we liked what was going on. I mean, it was like – it was like – it was like – uh I don't know, like four ticks in a bucket. You know, they were like it was like getting off on each other, and so we would we would actually go back there and, and many times and get the studio time for free. We would wait three and four hours sometimes at night, you know, to get into a studio, you know, and wouldn't get into like two o'clock in the morning, and we'd just blow out till, you know, couldn't handle it anymore. And uh, we had this engineer Lee Kiefer who. Uh, he used to like to hang out late, and I hung out with him, and we did a lot of editing and stuff and put together all these tracks. And Keltner brought uh, Harris and George down to listen to them. He liked it and signed us. And from hence on, we were attitudes. Paul Stallworth, I don't, can you look at your calendar? Can we set up a time to do part two? Yeah, I'm actually enjoying this. Uh, oh no, we're, I mean, I'm telling you, this is. I just, you're, you're amazing too. Um, I was just gonna ask you about a week from this Saturday, the uh, the 26th. Let me get my book out here. Yeah. I'm glad you're having fun. I, I'm sure I'm bringing stuff up you haven't thought about in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Someone told me we should have written a couple books by now. Well, you know, this is the start. I'm just put put it that way. That's it. 26 looks good. Uh, noon Pacific. Noon. Okay. Okay. And uh, if I don't talk to you before, I'll get you a copy of this. I might, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll put this one and I'll send this one to you tonight. I'll get a link to you tonight. Oh, okay. Okay. And then we'll do part two and we'll see where it goes from there. But uh, so great to connect with you, man. Really great to, you. to hear you, man. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I really appreciate you helping me dig out these things in the old chest <laughs> well it's and it's and it's it, believe me we're like you can't explain your musical talent and i can't explain when the spirits call but i mean they did and now we're here so much love dude there you go there you go yeah later on 
All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Big day here on the Jake Feinberg Show. Chuck Rainey, Paul Stallworth. We'll be back tomorrow with Charlie Musselwhite and Lamar White and Craig Pretzinger on the Jake Feinberg Show.